Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm, more and more, it's beginning to sound like a eulogy at, at this point in my life. I'm interviewing people, possible speakers. In 1989, uh, I had just been selected for uh, Brigadier General and uh, was told that I, my assignment would be in Stuttgart, Germany, in the European Command, which sounded great. And it sounded like a real opportunity for my family and I to enjoy German cuisine and the best beer in the world. Uh, unfortunately, as I was getting ready to depart to assume my duties, I, I had to go on an orientation tour of uh, Europe and the military commands. And as I was getting ready to leave, the wall suddenly came down. Gorbachev threw in the towel. So when uh, myself and about six other newly caught uh, admirals and generals arrived in Berlin to be briefed by the Berlin Brigade, uh, they didn't have a brief to give us. They, they looked at us and said, you know, the brief we've given probably for decades to all new uh, flag officer, general officers coming in is irrelevant as of yesterday. So we don't know what to do with you. So hang out in uh, West Berlin. We had a young second lieutenant who was our escort, Army second lieutenant. And he said, uh, would you guys like to go to East Berlin? And we said, well, can we do that? And he said, I don't know, but let's go. So he had a, a Volkswagen van. We piled into it, all in uniform, and we drove through Checkpoint Charlie. Now, all my life, Checkpoint Charlie was the forward point of our confrontation against the evil red menace. And I'm driving through an empty guard post into East Berlin. We drove through the streets, and as soon as you get off the main drag, which was really a Potemkin village, a facade, you were back into the World War II era, still bullet holes and bullet marks and pock marks in the buildings. People riding around in 50s vintage bicycles. We drove around for a while. We found a, a Russian army concern, and uh, we decided to drive in, or the lieutenant decided to drive in. <laughs> and as we drove through, we saw this startled Russian guard. He didn't know whether to shoot or salute as we went through. <laughs> we came out. We, we went around East Berlin for a while, and we came back at Checkpoint Charlie, Lieutenant stopped the vehicle, reached under his seat, he had a sledgehammer, and he said, let's get part of the wall. Now, I'm sure we were the first ones to do this and probably started a trend. <laughs> so here were six general officers and admirals banging with the sledgehammer on this wall, knocking off chips that we were coveting and, and, and putting in our pockets. And as we drove through there, and later as we made our way down to uh, southern Germany and some of the commands there, I was thinking that, you know, something important has happened here, and, I, and I'm not sure I understand it. Now, I heard President Bush and, and, uh, and Gorbachev talk about a, a new peace dividend and about a new world order. But for the next 10 years of my military career, I didn't see that order. I saw a new, a new disorder in the world. All sorts of military operations that I took part in or the military was taking part in, a world that was sort of coming apart for a lot of reasons. And the 10 or so years since then, in, in a number of peace efforts that were mentioned, I've, I've done about eight of them, and getting involved in conflict resolution around the world, from the Philippines, Indonesia, to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, effort, I see the world still has a lot of points that really are friction points and, and fragmentation points coming apart. And even watching it from a business angle and an academic angle, it's a very different world than it was 22 years ago. You know, the last century, we had three major reorderings of the world. Two came after the cataclysmic events of world wars, World War I and World War II. There was a third reordering at the end of the Cold War, and it was, I think, a surprise to us in many ways in that it happened so quickly and unexpectedly, but it didn't happen after a hot war, which maybe put us off our feet in terms of understanding how we maybe need to relook at the world, maybe even shape it or provide the conditions for it to do better, and for us and our interest to do better in this world. You know, I was taken back from my history lessons in the post-World War II era, where we had a Democratic administration, the Truman administration, a Republican Congress, and we had probably the most significant and important strategic thinker in our history in George Marshall, apolitical. So we had Arthur Vandenberg in the, in the, in the Congress, we had Harry Truman, and we had George Marshall. Brilliantly put together a strategy and a vision for how we would handle the world after World War II. Now, it's pretty tough for a team that just won to change the playbook, if you think about it. We emerged as the number one power in the world. Yet, those men 
saw the importance of taking a fresh look at the world. The Marshall Plan, which was very unpopular with American people, only 19% of the American people supported the Marshall Plan until the 80-some speeches that George Marshall gave. Why should we spend our treasure in rehabilit rehabilitating societies that we had just defeated, Germany, Japan, Western Europe? We joined NATO, created NATO. You imagine George Washington, Thomas Jefferson rolling in their graves had warned us against foreign entanglements. Here we were creating a military alliance, an attack on one's attack on all. You attack Luxembourg, we're going to come to their aid. This was unheard of. We revamped government, created the National Security Council, the CIA, the World Bank, many other things that reshaped the way we would do business in Washington, the way we would view the world. We decided we had a menace that we had to deter and contain, that we could not have the unthinkable, another hot war. And think about how, over almost half a century, that strategy worked. I think at the end of the Cold War, and certainly by now, we need to take a fresh look at this world that we face. And this is a tough subject. Believe me, we've all heard the debates. You've all been involved in it. And we've just heard the comment from those kids. Americans now are wondering more about their own domestic issues, the economy, our energy dependence, our education systems. These are the hot topics. And we're forgetting that we live in a very small planet, a flat world, as Thomas Friedman said. And if we don't pay attention to what our obligations are, what our purpose is, our role in this world, I think we're going to get so consumed by our own internal issues that we're going to end up on the wrong end of, of economic uh, security and other issues that are going to plague us that come from other than our own shores. In that time, since I crossed over Checkpoint Charlie, I'd just like to mention a few things that have occurred that have changed our world. One is the rise in globalization. Now, Steve just told you in his business how it's been so internationalized. I was talking to a group of Midwestern food distributors a couple of years ago, and I was talking about how their world had become so internationalized. After the, my talk, I had a, a, a man who had inherited his food distribution business 25 years ago, from his father, who inherited it from his grandfather. And he said, you know, you really hit a note with me. He said, when I inherited my business, you could draw a circle around three states in the middle of the United States. That was my world, my suppliers, my distributors, my customers. He said, I don't know how it happened, but I am global now. He said, if you want to order something from my company, you go online to my website. It's managed in Bangalore, India. He said, my suppliers are global in all sorts of exotic foods. My customers are global. I have to worry about a drought in a certain part of the world that affects my supplies. I have to worry about political unrest in places where I, I sell and have significant customers. And his little world blew up on him in such a short period of time, he was still trying to figure out how it impacted on him. I used to do some consulting work with uh, businessmen who wanted to do business overseas. And I would take them to potential customers. Middle East, South America, a number of other places. And what amazed me is how much more sophisticated the international community was, business community, than the American community. I used to counsel them that if you walk in and start to do business right away, you'll turn them off. You better demonstrate that you have an appreciation for this planet and all aspects of it. They want to talk politics. They want to talk about the environment. They want to talk about a whole set of issues that demonstrate that you have a global awareness and you understand how that impacts your business and their business. And you know, because we sort of have this residual isolationist feeling and attitude, it doesn't work out there. And we are dependent. This is Thomas Friedman's flat world. There's been a power reordering since that time I crossed Checkpoint Charlie. There are new powers in the world. If you read Kaplan's book, Monsoon, he says it's the Indian Ocean. We see that now the emphasis is on the Pacific, but we certainly know the old order is not there. Rising powers, India, China, Brazil, maybe a resurgent Russia, and others smaller, that, but yet economically or otherwise significant, that we had better readjust our policies and our relationships to reflect that new world. We have old institutions like the UN Security Council that reflects the end of World War II or at best the Cold War. Many institutions reflect bygone days as to where the power bases lie. We have 1.3 billion people in this world undergoing a major transformation. They are Muslims. 
I spent most of the last 20 years in that part of the world. And it's fits and starts. It's Arab Springs, it's a removal of dictators, it's hegemons that want to dominate the region, it's religious fanatics, it's a real mix. And one-sixth of the population of this earth is undergoing this tumultuous change. And believe me, that will affect us. Our national security interests, where our energy resources and dependency lie, and many other aspects are dependent upon how that part of the world gets through all this and, and the role we play in it. We know we have the, a series of economic crises around the world and a shrinking middle class, not only in this country but elsewhere, which is not good for, for the planet. Our energy resources are being depleted. We have a high demand. We're not getting serious about uh, cutting our dependency on fossil fuels. You know, and, and unfortunately, the good Lord did not put these places in the most stable parts of the world that we have to go get them or ensure access. When I commanded the U.S. Central Command, my missions were to ensure access to that part of the world, ensure the free flow of energy, ensure the freedom of navigation, because the major trade routes of the world go through those choke points, the Strait of Malacca, the Strait of Hormuz, Bab el-Mandeb, the Suez Canal. So if you think this is a part of the world we can ignore, or it's just about oil or natural gas, it's far more than that. That instability uh, washes over on, onto our shores in many aspects. We've also seen the rise of information technology. And it, we're still trying to grasp the implication of that. Social media, you know, the, the impact and, and the force it has, both for good and not so good. WikiLeaks, you know, we, we, we now can look at our teenage kids and understand that they are communicating, transmitting, receiving. No thinking going on in between, but they are, they are working that information technology pretty hard. I can tell you as a businessman, as, as the chairman of the board of BAE Systems, which in this state, you know, we have a great relationship, uh, that every day I have a CIO, chief information officer, coming in and telling me our systems are getting obsolete. We've got to invest X billions of dollars in new information technology systems. Old legacy systems aren't going to get it, aren't going to make you competitive. What is the implication for this? Understanding it. Cybersecurity. The ability to protect ourselves. As a commander of U.S. Central Command, when tensions began to mount, before a shot was fired, we would watch the hits on our systems, secure and, and unsecure systems, unclassified and classified. And the, and the number of hits day by day as the tensions mounted would rise. It struck me one day, I am already at war in cyberspace. And not one you know, element of kinetic energy has been exchanged, when not one round fired, and you're already at war. I don't think we fully understand the implication of that. We have become an urbanized society. About three years ago, we crossed the line. More of our species, more human beings, live in cities than outside of cities. These cities are untenable. These cities are attracting people who have depleted resources outside the cities, are desperately looking for jobs, and we have created these massive urban areas around the world that are just boiling pots that, that can create all sorts of problems in terms of mass migrations, in terms of disease and health issues, in terms of breeding extremists and others that will have global impact as we unfortunately have seen. We have in the last 20 years a changing set of demographics in this world. In some parts of the world we have a youth bulge which creates its own problems. In some parts of the developed world we have just the opposite. And we don't have the youth that maybe can take care of an aging but going to be around a long time, I'm happy to say, group of senior citizens. You know, and, and, and my kids are going to have to take care of me. I promised I would live to 100 just to get revenge on them. <laughs> but that's going to create an opposite set of problems. That imbalance in demographics affects different parts of the world differently. I mentioned migrations. Illegal and legal. People are on the move. If you can't make it here, they're going to go to where they can make it. And if anything, the, the, the removal of that bipolar system between us and the communist world has unleashed, I think, this movement around the world. You are now free to move about the world. It is threatening identities. It is challenging economic systems. It is creating all sorts of issues that we have a difficulty to deal with, not only in our own country in terms of undocumented or Ill illegals that come in, but also in Europe and elsewhere. And this constant shift in movement creates all sorts of tensions and problems that have to be dealt with. There, is, there are environmental problems out there. Those that would deny that the environment is changing need only to go outside and take a look. There is an Arctic Ocean that's disappearing. What does it mean when the Arctic Ocean becomes a transportable, navigable sea? 
with all its resources. Who's going to exploit that? Five countries have borders on that Arctic Ocean. I was on a study with a number of admirals and generals looking at the security implications of the Arctic as a transportable sea. I can tell you there are parts of the world that I visit, that I see, that, that are becoming deserts, that were formerly agriculturally lush and, and provided for people. I can see places where the water resources are drying up, you know, where glaciers are drying up, where water so resources are being overused. The capital of Yemen, Sana, will run out of water in three to five years. Amman and Jordan, the Gaza Strip, they're all threatened in terms of a water shortage and all the implications that might mean. The lack of conservation, the lack of, of, of proper agricultural and manufacturing processes to protect our water systems. This is a global problem. And, and it is going to create a, a, hum, a, a tremendous humanitarian problem if, if something isn't done about it. We've seen the rise of non-state entities around the world. You know, we used to think we relate to each other as Americans or Europeans, you know, in, in Brits or uh, uh, Italians or whatever. We don't relate that way anymore. Facebook is the third largest nation in the world. And maybe there are many people in the world that their identity on Facebook is more important to them than their national identity. You know, identities are changing. I just came back from two weeks in Afghanistan. I came back on Sunday. And I could tell you, if you walk around Afghanistan and you say, well, you're an Afghan, you're going to get an answer, I'm a Pashtun, I'm a Baluchi, I'm a Tajik. You know, and, and some of these artificially, colonially created boundaries have no meaning. The idea of this sort of Westphalian sovereignty is the dominant way we interact with other societies is crumbling. Non-governmental organizations, you know, extremist groups, they have borderless identities. Why are we having difficulty deciding on what victory is when we go into a conflict and we, we commit our military forces? Because the old definition of victory was somebody in a uniform that represented a geographically defined state with a regime where our objectives could be to defeat that military, to march to that capital, to take down that regime, victory defined. Where is the capital of Al-Qaeda? What are their boundaries? Who are their soldiers? And so we are involved in conflicts now that can't be defined by the old paradigm and the old method of victory and defeat. And we're going to have to figure a new approach to this. We are dealing with more and more failed or incapable states out there. And what does it matter if a Somalia or a Yemen fails? I spent three tours of duty in Somalia, a lot of time in Yemen. Well, it does matter because they become sanctuaries, problem areas. Extremists can operate out of there. Piracy can, can flow and block one of those key choke points that I mentioned. They become festering sores in places like the Arabian Peninsula, which can spread and cause greater global issues and problems that affect us. Health and, and, and other issues can come out of there. Mass migrations, refugees. All these problems will come back to haunt us. I really believe it is time for another Vandenberg Truman Marshall moment. I really believe that we have to sit back and define the world because it, it cannot be defined in terms that we defined it in the 80s and 70s and 60s and 50s. And then we have to clearly articulate what our interests are, where our values are best served, and very importantly, what we can afford to do. What are the limits of American power? But most importantly, we have got to stop over-militarizing our foreign policy. And I don't only speak from, as, a, as one retired general. I think, as was said before, we have a, a number that have committed to this project. I told you I just came back from Afghanistan, and I spent a couple of weeks before that in Iraq. None of our generals are looking to continue war and fighting. All of our generals out there and all of our sergeants want to provide security for something else to happen. The political, the economic, the social development the institutions that need to be built so these societies can cope with that hostile environment. As General Petraeus said, you can't shoot your way to victory in these wars. The military can provide security, but the military can't provide a path to good governance, building capacity, rule of law, developing economic systems, helping with social reform and change, the role of women in, in, in society, and issues like that that have to be dealt with. We don't have equal partners on these battlefields. When I went down to look at the provincial re uh, reconstruction teams, I found that 80% of them were military, and it has nothing to do with the security requirement. Why so many uniforms? 
I looked at a task force in, in, in uh, Afghanistan that dealt with corruption in government and helping to find and, 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 and create a process that eliminated it or, or drastically reduced it. 50% military and headed by a military. We need Department of State. We need Department of Justice. We need Department of Agriculture. We need USAID, the EPA, and all the other organizations in government to be equal partners because this environment today requires us to build institutions in fragile societies or broken societies so they can cope with a hostile environment they face, whether it's man-made or not. It can't just always be an answer at the end of the gun. We can go in and project very powerful military forces, by the way, at great expense. We are not cheap. And contrary to, to the slogans, we are not expeditionary. We spend billions of dollars when we commit the U.S. military. You put one soldier Marine on the ground for one year in Afghanistan, it costs you, the taxpayer, one million dollars. You think about that when we have hundreds of thousands and millions over the course of a conflict that lasts a decade. And they cannot fix the non-military things. When I went to do the assessment in Iraq, I sat with General Odierno in his operations center, and after about a week, I turned to him and said, Ray, if I closed my eyes, I would not know this is a military operations center. And he was kind of startled and looked at me, and he said, why? I said, listen to what you're being briefed on. They provided pesticides for the date palm harvest, and they monitored the date palm harvest. This is the military. They ran the recreational swimming pools, the museums, the zoos. They ran the energy fusion cell, trying to build the electric, electricity uh, power up to 24-hour service. They ran the negotiation and mediation cells that helped bring the tribes together and the different ethnic and religious factions to settle their differences. And you know why they did it? because we didn't have the capacity on the ground for those that should be doing it. And before I, I, I give you the impression this is only an American role, this needs to be an international role. We need to build the partnerships, a relevant United Nations. We need to work with the non-governmental non organizations, private volunteer organizations. Other regional organizations are committed to do this. There are a lot of the willing out there. They need the capacity. They need the planning, they need the organization to bring it together. The security piece of this should be one-fourth of the effort. The political, the economic, and social development institution building needs to be the other 75%. And it cannot and should not be done by our military. That's an expensive solution, and they are being stuck with the mission. Our Secretary of State and, Secretary of and last Secretary of Defense both have said this an over-militarized foreign policy, too much dependency on the military, the military involved in things they were not tasked to do and not by our Constitution or by what the missions we give them should allow them to do. We need to bolster that capability. We need to create the international partnerships. We need to smartly advise and, and, and provide for the amount that we can afford to support these efforts. And all that should be part of a structure of a new foreign policy strategy and outlook. The last national security strategy that was published talked about the criticality of our repairing our education system, cutting our energy dependence on fossil fuels, and improving our economy. That's all well and good. That's not foreign policy, though. That's the immediate need we have here. There's a whole world out there. And unless we interact in that world as a leader and in the right way, we will pay a penalty down the road. We will become another empire put on the scrap heap of history. That's not our purpose. That's not our role. That's not where we are. I want to leave you with one story. When I was a week ago eating lunch on a rug with some Afghans, I had an old Afghan man sitting beside me. Big beard, obviously in his 70s or 80s. And we had a great conversation through an interpreter. And he was very animated, very appreciative of us being there. And one of the Marines I was with leaned down and said, he's the former Taliban commander for Marja. We killed both his sons in battle. And I turned to him and looked at him, and he said to me, we found you are the righteous ones. You know, and, and enough is enough. You are the path we must follow. We believe that. You are America. 
And I think we need to learn to be America. It means something in the world. A friend of mine who's the foreign minister from Qatar told me, your problem here in this part of the world is the image of an American is a soldier in full combat gear. Others, like the Chinese, their image is an investor, a developer, a humanitarian worker. You need to change your image. Thank you very much. General Zinni, thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. An outstanding uh, picture, I think, that you painted, which really raises so many questions for all of us here in New Hampshire who have really have a lot of tough decisions to make over the next year. First, an election coming up in January, and also then a general election coming up in a year from now. And I think when you hear your remarks, it really brings to the question how, where, when. And, uh, of course, in our country right now, we have a terrible, terrible budget debate that we have to make about defense, about foreign policy, about foreign affairs, about where monies need to be allocate, allocated. So as you paint this picture and you, you try to format in the minds of our candidates and the minds of the voting public, how, where, and when do we put our money? Where does the money need to go? It, it, of course, we have to keep a strong defense. But when you talk about this smart power, which sounds like barnacles throughout the world of doing good deeds, Peace Corps kinds of things, how, how does it all come together and fit into our political process? Well, it, it first comes together. In my, you know, I, taught, uh, I was taught to uh, develop a strategy before you did anything. I mean, military officers in their education system go from the tactical, the operational, to the strategic level. And at the strategic level, you have to define where you're going. What is the vision? What is the vision for America? What do we want to be in 10, 15, 20 years? How do we want to be regarded in the world? And, and when you get that definition, then you need to see what gets you there. What are the goals? What do you need to achieve to, to, to get there? In, in, in our case, politically, economically, socially, in promotion of our values, in terms of our own security, and what's valuable to us. We have to define our, our interests. We have to stay true to our values. Sometimes interests and values collide, you know, and, and that's tough decision making for uh, any president and any Congress. That's the politics of that, it. Well, that's the politics of it. And we, you know, all, all throughout history from the Alien and Sedition Acts of John Adams all the way through to the Patriot Act and, uh, and the Enhanced Interrogation, we've seen issues. Abraham Lincoln had them with waiver of habeas corpus. And we've had other tough issues where values and interests uh, you know, come in, into conflict. But we've got to define them so we understand where the friction points may be and, 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 and be clear and honest about it. The most important thing a strategy does, and this goes to your point about affordability, we've got to set priorities. Priorities need to be set vertically, not horizontally. You know, we just can't write something for everybody, and that's tough to say in, a, in, in obviously a political year here, but when you're trying to be everybody to everything, then you're nobody to nobody. You know? and, and that's unfortunately where we get to, where we don't have defined priorities and defined interests. Where is the center? Where are our interests in the world? What should those relationships be? Is a China an enemy? Is it an enemy in a military sense? Is it an economic competitor? Can we relate to a China? Can we engage with a China? Can we partner with a China? Where do we have to protect ourselves from a, a China? And I just use that as an example. What are our interests in the Middle East? What do we want to promote? Uh, out of this Arab Spring, we hope what comes out of that street is a greater respect for the things we value, democracy, freedom of speech, representative government, free market economy. Uh, how, what are we doing to promote that? That's a part of the world that we want stable in the end. We have a lot riding on that, not only in terms of our own economics, but also our own security. So what, what, where's the articulation of all this? Then you can tell me what the bill is and what we can afford or not afford. In the end of the uh, Iraq conflict, which, which began yesterday, we have our military coming home. Uh, how is the health of our military? How is the health of our young people that have served now for five, ten years in Iraq? This is, another, this is a second generation of soldier that has moved through this process. And are we, are we are instructing our young people in the right avenue, or are they taking the leadership and trying to redefine the definition of our military? Well, first of all, and, and I say this as someone that, it's hard for me to look at this objectively, my son is a Marine. He, he's, he did six deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. 
I'll tell you, you know, when I went down and looked at those soldiers, Marines, sailors, airmen, that we ha and civilians that we have over there, the morale is very high. The retention rates are not a problem. They want to stay. Uh, they, they like the military. I'll tell you where their concerns are. Their concerns are where is their military going? Uh, the old guys like me worry about the hollow force again that we had in the 70s after Vietnam. We're going to cut defense spending. And, 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 and I think everybody agrees that the defense will have to be cut to whatever extent. But if we cherry pick programs, if we just arbitrarily cut force structure, we still keep the same level of commitments around the world. You send out hollow forces to do those. They are not manned sufficiently. The money that you need to train and maintain your equipment isn't sufficient. And we end up with, with what has been called the hollow force. I think, much like our national security strategy, our security strategy, our military strategy, our defense strategy has to begin with a strategic overview. We are in many places of the world because they're legacy doctrines. We are there because of the Carter Doctrine or the Truman Doctrine even, Nixon Doctrine. You know, we, we, are, we have commitments around the world that we never seem to end or we never seem to evolve to another relationship. And I think we need to relook where our military is, our presence, justify it. We need to look strategically maybe where we should be and we aren't. We need to look at partnering. You know, we need to look at alliances and military cooperation in a different view. This is a different world. Old school, new school. The young kids are saying you're old school. Mm -hmm. They're new school. Uh, is, there, is there something in place now uh, that, can be, that can be implemented that says to our foreign policy, um, okay, our military is being trained in this way, this way, and this way. Of course, the guns and the, and the ammo and the ability to fight, but yet dividing the military in a way so that they can do the types of soft power things or smart power things that need to be done. I, I think we need, first of all, our military has to be the hard power. There's no doubt about it. We need a military that can fight our country's battles, defend our, our interests and our people and our property and our way of life. That's their primary mission in life. Everything else can distract from that if you're not careful. Careful. What they have to understand in terms of the soft power, power equation that equals smart power is how they support it, not how they do it. What do I need to do to promote it? What do I need to do to, to support it, provide security for it? How do I cooperate with it? Now be specific with me on that a bit. Well, let's take a provisional reconstruction team. Now, a provisional reconstruction team in Iraq and Afghanistan is supposed to go down to the local level, help the local uh, government uh, it, it, to help build the capacity to govern, to plan, to budget, to uh, build programs, uh, how to manage resources and allocate them appropriately. Uh, also, how to deal with social issues, you know, uh, uh, bringing women into the workforce, you know, getting more productivity out of 50 percent of the population that in some cultures, uh, uh, you know, are, are, are not able to contribute. And, and now are, they're finding in many places that uh, that was their loss. I just, for example, heard the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates say that, you know, we've wasted 50 percent of our population uh, all these centuries and now discovering that that's important. But if I see somebody in uniform doing that, I'm concerned. You know, my son was a company commander in Marja, Marine Infantry Company commander. And as he was getting ready for the offensive in Marja, he had called me and told me I got an additional duty. I am the battalion's non-kinetic officer. And I said, what's that? He said, well, I'm supposed to engage with the village chief, and part of my mission is to encourage him to grow alternative crops to opium and marijuana. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember that he majored in football in college, <laughs> and he's in the infantry, and I said, what the hell do you know about agriculture? Zip. You know, yeah. but, and, and so where is the Department of Agriculture? It's not that they aren't willing to do it. It's not that they're certainly not capable of doing it. Have we developed the capacity to put them in? And they would be a less expensive, more affordable solution to that and more appreciated on the ground. Mm -hmm. The first thing when they went into Marja, the old Afghan leaders told my son is, we remember America from 1952 when you built the irrigation systems out here that helped us farm. So that had the memory, not Charlie Wilson's war. The memory is when we came and helped them uh, agriculturally produce and have an economic system and a basis for, basis for survival, mm -hmm. a soft power contribution. General, thank you. We're, we're running up against the gun. We want to keep everybody on their schedule here this morning. We may ask you some more questions, okay. but thank you for to, to the general. Thank you. And we're here from the service.